Well, before we jump in this morning, um, I'm just guessing that you're the kind of people that would like to hear some good news. So the part of the work that we do at Ambassador Services International is we help rescue targeted Christians from around the world. Now, the difference between a targeted Christian and a persecuted Christian is a persecuted Christian uh, has a bad time and people harass and persecute him. A targeted Christian is someone who's actively being hunted so that they can be killed. And it's by terrorists and bad guys. And uh, we had the, the blessing of participating in a successful uh, uh, rescue and retraction of a family from an African country earlier this year. And two months ago, we got involved in another situation where there were two families, so husband and wife, times two, that's four, and then five children between the two families, a total of nine people. We got the phone call that they were being hunted in a very dangerous situation and that it was going to require um, a significant amount of faith and trust and finance and that they were going to have to move through some very dangerous territory where they were being hunted. It was going to take some special brave people um, to escort them and get them through very tough situations. And uh, I can report for the very first time of this morning that I officially got word yesterday after two months they are alive and well and safe. That, friends, <clears throat> we don't know what that's like um, here in the United States yet to be uh, hunted for our faith, uh, but when you can participate in it and you can look into nine people's faces and go, you know what, unless we're involved in that, most likely they're dead. Their lives have been taken from them. They've been slaughtered at the hands of, of extremist terrorists. And so I just want to say to the devil this morning, nanny, nanny, nanny. He loses one more time. Amen, amen. Yes, he is a loser indeed. Um, so this morning we want to continue with this theme that Pastor Ian has started talking about really living the abundant life and living our lives in such a way um, that, that we ourselves are going to be impacted first by God and his grace and power, and then we get to live as extensions of God's grace and power to impact a lost and hurting world around us. This morning, we're going to read uh, two good chunks of scripture from Matthew, or excuse me, from Mark chapter 4. So open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. We're going to unpack this morning the, what's known as the parable um, of the sower, or some people call it the parable of the soils for obvious reasons. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We're going to read the whole thing. And again, Jesus began to teach by the sea. This would be the Sea of Galilee. And a great multitude was gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen. That's how he said it. <laughs> because he wants to get their attention. I, I do want to just say kind of parenthetically, this starts with Jesus saying, listen. And it ends with him saying, he who has ears to hear. This is about listening, and so I want to charge you. I want to exhort you this morning. Listen. Pay attention. We're not here just for some silly Sunday morning religious meeting. We are here to hear from the Word of God. Listen this morning. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and, be and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell 
among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But the other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And Jesus said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, between what Jesus, is, what Jesus' words are that are recorded for us until the next section where Jesus is going to actually interpret for us what he meant. This is one of the parables where Jesus actually explains. And so we don't have to guess or kind of wonder or think about what this is about. Jesus tells us very specifically what this is about. So now we drop down to Mark chapter 4, verses 14 through 20, and Jesus is now going to unpack this for us. He said, the sower sows the word. He's sowing the word of God. He's throwing it out there, sowing the word of God. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, listen to this, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves, and so they endure only for a time afterward when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they stumble." Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and what? The lusts or the desire for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit some 30, some 60, and some 100. All right, now, friends, we're going to unpack this this morning. Let me start by just making some quick observations here. Parables are are true, uh, life-giving, true color stories. They're they're natural stories that, that help us apply spiritual truth and reality. It's what a parable is. And so Jesus talking to some farmers, although at this point he's on the Sea of Galilee, he's talking to an agricultural community that is clearly going to understand what it is that he's talking about because he's giving them an agricultural story. But this agricultural story has spiritual symbolism in it. That's what a parable is. That's what this parable is in particular. So when he's talking about the soil here, he's not talking about soil. He's talking about soil. What soil is he talking about? The soil in this parable, the soils here represent, listen to me, the spiritual condition of your heart. That's what the soil is here, the spiritual condition of your heart. Now, let me tell you some things about these different soils that we just, we just need to understand before we go further. First of all, whatever soil you might have identified with as I was reading through this and, and explaining Jesus' interpretation, you are not this morning here a predetermined soil. What I mean by that is God didn't look at you and say, hey, you, for the rest of your life, you're stony soil and there's nothing you can do about it. You over there, you're thorny soil. You over there, you're wayside soil, and you can't do anything about it. You are not, say it, not a predetermined soil. Next, soils are not progressive stages in your life. Like, okay, I've met Jesus, and so right out of the chute, I, I got a long way to go, and so I'm just gonna be wayside soil for a while. And then after wayside soil, you know, I might get a few things right and get a few things together, and then I'm going to become stony soil. And then after I'm stony soil for five or 10 years, then I probably become thorny soil. And then after 10 or 15 years of that, I'm finally going to become good soil. Uh Uh-uh. 
not only are you not a predetermined soil, okay, there's, you, you aren't some form of, of a progressive type of soil or stage. It doesn't work that way. Soils, friend, listen to me, they are situational, they may be seasonal, and they may even be a lifestyle that you choose, but make no mistake about it, You and I choose what kind of soil we are going to be in any given situation that comes our way. We're going to be wayside soil. It's our choice. We're going to be stony soil or thorny soil or good soil, listen to me, based on what we do with the word that God speaks to us in that situation or in that season. You might be a couple different soils at the exact same time depending on how you respond to what God's word, will, and ways are. There could be something in my life, man, where I'm great soil. I got, like, I'm great with that. There could be something else happening at the exact same time where I'm like, Yeah, I'm more wayside on that one. (laughs) So understanding this, that soil is the spiritual condition of my heart and looking at the different kinds of soil that Jesus talks about, ultimately, what is my goal? I want to be good soil in all things at all times. That's the goal is to be good soil, okay? The type of soil you choose to be, we can't say this clear enough, is going to determine whether you bear fruit or not. Let me say it again. The type of soil you choose to be is going to determine whether or not you bear fruit. And you living the deeper, abundant, fruit-bearing life requires you to be good soil. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but if you look at the four different soils, how many of the four soils actually bore fruit? One, three soils were good for no eternal fruit. One soil, good soil, produced fruit. It's a sobering thing right there. All right, so let's start with wayside soil. Wayside soil, it's the first soil that Jesus talked about here. Wayside soil is, is, is side of the road kind of soil. If, if you've ever gone on the side of the road, it's a really interesting thing. You, you, maybe you didn't volunteer to do trash or litter pickup, but maybe just in driving down the road, you, you notice things on the side. What's wayside soil like? Wayside soil, the stuff right on the side of a road, it has some soil, but very little most of the time. You know what you find? You find leftover rocks and gravel from when they built the road, or you find hunks of blacktop that broke off the shoulder of the blacktop because some big old truck with a bunch of cows and horses ran over it. And you find other stuff. You find weeds in wayside soil, and you find empty sun drop bottles and little Debbie Swiss cake roll wrappers and empty bags of Funyuns and Doritos and cigarette butts and losing lottery tickets. You find all kinds of stuff on the wayside soil. Wayside soil, friends, here's what it is. Wayside soil is soil that hasn't been cared for, cleaned up, or cultivated. Wayside soil is just wayside soil. It's just trashy. It's unkept. It's not cared for. It's not doted over and cultivated. We can choose to be, spiritually speaking, wayside soil if we want. We can choose to be that. Now, none of us like, are going to make a conscious effort to say, you know what, man, my goal in life is I want to be wayside soil. Doritos, Funyuns, and Diet Dr. Pepper bottles, cigarette butts. No, but listen to me, beloved. If we examine whether we're actually bearing fruit for the kingdom of God or not, it might tell us whether we're wayside soil or not. 
Because we have this thing in our culture and stuff that if, you know, I, okay, I'm going to church. But you're going to church, you're occupying a seat. But listen, y'all, if you're thinking about lunch, if you're thinking about work next week, if you're, you know, what I mean, pick the crazy things. 30 plus years of being a pastor, I listen to people come up afterward and I go, what? What, what, what? Well, Pastor Steve, I, I, you, know, I, you know, I think it's okay if you dress up every once in a while, but you really shouldn't be wearing a sport coat because it could offend some people. And I'm like, we're talking about the word of God and you're thinking about my sport coat. <laughs> this is wayside soil, Pastor Jeff. So here is this uncultivated, uncared for soil. And what does Jesus say? He said what happens is on that kind of neglected soil, when the word falls, he said it, when the word falls on that type of spiritual life and heart, because it hasn't been prepared and, rece and pre prepared to receive the word of God, what happens? Satan comes immediately and steals it. That means before this sermon's over, it's already gone. It's already gone because of how we approach God's word, because of how we approach our life in church and what it really means and what really matters. And, you know, all that matters is that I'm there. No, it doesn't just matter that you're here. It matters that you're here to hear. That's what matters. So Satan comes on wayside soil when the word goes out and he comes immediately and steals the word. How can he come immediately and do that? Because it hasn't been prepared. The soil of your spiritual existence hasn't been prepared to receive with meekness and humility the implanted word. So he comes and steals it. Now we have to ask ourselves another question. Why would the devil want to steal the word of God from you? Because he knows if you receive it and believe it and do it, you're going to be someone who produces fruit for the kingdom of God, and he can't stand the thought of that. So he looks at wayside soil, he sees his opportunity, and he, come and he comes and steals the word before the person even knows that the word was there in the first place. Wayside soil. Jesus said, there's people just like that. Now, we're not talking about totally lost pagan people. We're talking about people, Sam, that hear the word. He said they heard the word. The word fell on their soil, on their hearts. I'm talking about church people. I gotta quit whispering. I sound like Biden when I do that. <laughs> huh? What? Did he say something about the president? What? 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 So this morning, if you're hearing me already and you're going, dude, I think I might be wayside soil. Okay, like I'm not glad that you're wayside soil, but like we can do something about it. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, listen to what the prophet said. Sow for yourselves righteousness. In other words, start doing the right thing now. And you'll reap in mercy. God will be good to you. Here's what he says. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Do you know what fallow ground is? Fallow ground is wayside soil. Fallow ground is ground that has massive potential, but no planting. And he says it's time to come and break it up, man. Break it up, break up that hard, dry, parched, puckered ground, trash-filled ground. Break it up, cultivate it, care for it, plant it, get ready for a harvest. Break up your fallow ground this morning if you find yourself being wayside soil. All right, stony soil is our second one. Stony soil. 
Stony soil is soil that's been prepared pretty good, but underneath the surface, looks good on top, underneath the surface, there are stones that remain. Now, listen to this. This, this amazes me, this parable. Stony soil, Jesus said, here's what they do. They hear the word, and it doesn't get stolen right away, but what does happen? They receive it with gladness. Hallelujah, man, that's a, that's a good word. They receive it with gladness, they're happy about it, but Jesus said there's a problem, not with the word, but with them. And Jesus said, because they have no root in themselves, they only endure for a short time. Now here again, we're gonna see Satan's attacking purposes. This stony ground hears it, gets excited about it, but Satan knows he can't steal it, but he's got to do something else. Listen to me. Let me say it like this. Any word that you receive, Satan is going to challenge it in some way. He is not going to let you receive the implanted word. And if he can't steal it, here's what he's going to do. He's going to challenge it by sending tribulation or persecution. It's what he says right there in that parable. And so the stony person hears it, says yes and amen, and that's awesome. And Satan goes, oh yeah, pal? Let me see how much you believe that word. Let me send some tribulation and persecution your way. And then let me see how happy you are about that word. If he can't steal it, he's going to challenge it. And when it gets challenged, stony soil, because it has no root in itself, only endures for a short time. And then people are done. I'm done with it. I'm done with God's word. Didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And so I've got no, there's no, there's no depth of Christian character. There's no depth of Christian commitment in stony soil. It's only happy about the word so long as the word promises them something wonderful. But when the word gets challenged for the word's sake, they're done. Stony soil. Wow. Well, let's just take a little quiz so far. We're halfway done. We're two, we're two soils into this. Go ahead, be honest. Don't lie in church. <laughs> Anybody ever been a little wayside in your life? Okay. It's fine if you don't raise your hand. You're a liar. <laughs> Anybody been a little, little stony in your life? Yeah. Man, you were, you were happy about that. woo God's got a good plan for my life. Glory to God. And the devil says, oh, yeah? And because of the word's sake, the word then attracts the enemy to challenge you with tribulation and persecution to see if you really believe and if you're really happy about the word. Times in my life, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, Paul writes and says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. What does he say? Rooted. Everybody say it. Rooted. Yeah. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught. In other words, Paul taught people, man, you got to be rooted. You've got to have some root in yourself. You can't be stony soil. You've got to be rooted. You've got to have some depth. You've got to have some character and some commitment because the devil's going to challenge the word and you have to be able to endure the scorching of, of son's tribulation, of Satan's persecution. You've got to have some depth. So Paul says, you got to be rooted, rooted, and built up. you got to be established. It means being unmovable. It means being secure. 
It means that you just don't shrivel up and die because the word's been challenged. I love this promise. Proverbs, thir- uh, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 3 and verse 12, just a few verses later. Solomon writes and says, a man is not established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous, what, cannot be moved. And then he says in verse 12, the root of the righteous does what? It yields fruit. See, you got to be rooted. You've got to be rooted in the word. So you get rooted in the word, you go deep so that you can be built up and go high so that you can be established and stand strong. And when you do that, you are living the abundant life. When you do that, you're being impacted by the word and you're impacting people around you because they see something real and powerful that's happening in your life and then it happens through your life. Rooted, built up, and established, bearing fruit. Man, you gotta, you gotta have some depth. Turn to your neighbor and said, are you deep? Go ahead, are you deep? Thorny soil. Some of you are still locked up about my Biden comment, I can tell. (laughs) Thorny soil. What's thorny soil? Soil number three, it's that which surrounds and chokes the word out of you. And just like the other soils, thorny soil hears the word, just like the wayside and the stony did, but here's what Jesus says about thorny soil. First thing he says is, the cares of this world. That, those few words I could preach until dinner tonight. The cares of this world. It literally means because of the anxieties of life and living in a broken, fallen place. The anxieties that come from living in this broken earth. The cares of the world. It chokes the word out of you. Whew. So we look around the world and we go, man, the world's fixing to be on fire here. Like we got some kindling, but the flames are getting ready to start howling. And we got the economy and we got protests and we got, I mean, the list goes on and on. We got fentanyl killing 120,000 people and on and on. There's, can I get an amen? There's plenty to be anxious about. There's plenty to be concerned about. But what Jesus said about thorny soil is this, that that if you find yourself just freaking out and anxious and worried all the time about all the stuff we can be anxious and worried about, that anxiety is going to choke the promise and power of God's word out of your life. I'm all for being educated. I want to watch the news and read the news. I do it all day long every day. But if at the end of the day or the beginning to start my day, I don't put it within the the confines of thus saith the Lord, that he's in charge, that he's calling the shots, that he's forever faithful, and that he's got a plan in the midst of the mayhem, listen, if I'm not looking at God's word, the anxiety of the world takes you out. The next thing he said, it's not just the cares of the world, He said, here's something else that'll choke your spiritual life out. It is the deceitfulness of riches. What's that? It's the seduction that joy and peace are gonna come through you accumulating wealth. And it's it's the deceitfulness. It is the seduction of it. It is the lying, beguiling spell that tells you You don't need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let him add everything else to you. It's you need to seek wealth. You need to seek riches. You need to seek security. You need to build up your own wealth and riches. And then with any time left over, then you can seek God later. The deceitfulness of riches. Next, he says, Third, the desire for other things. That word desire there actually means lust. It it, it is a lust, a want, a drive for other things. 
It means worldly things. It means riches, and it means power, and it means fame, and it means platform, and it means ease, and it means comfort, and it means, you know, like the good life. And when you lust for that, and you get seduced by wealth, and you're bound by anxiety, you find yourself being thorny soil where the word of God just gets choked. You can't even breathe because the devil has your throat closed off. He is choking you because you're not letting the word, I'm not letting the have its rightful place in my life. So, for those of you this morning that may be feeling anxious, the cares of this world, I will remind you of this famous passage of Scripture. Listen! Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But what? In everything... By prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will do what? It will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. If you find yourself being anxious, Paul doesn't say just stop being anxious. He says start praying. And if your prayers aren't availing, I love this, start supplicating. Prayer is making an ask. Supplicating is making a cry. And then what does he say happens? In that spiritual transaction with God, all of a sudden, peace that surpasses explanation or understanding overcomes anxiety, and then I'm protected. I'm rooted, grounded, established. I'm not being choked. I'm being guarded by Jesus himself. For those of you who have succumbed to the deceitfulness of riches, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money, not just money, it is the love of money. It's a root of all kinds of evil. For which, look at this, for which some have strayed from the faith. It means that people who were in the faith became thorny soil, they succumb to the deceitfulness of riches, and then what happened, they end up straying from the faith. Because in their greediness, they became pierced in themselves, pierced through with many sorrows. The cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and then finally, he said, the lust of other things, the desire for other things. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. See, because what I need is a word from God to overcome that which I'm facing and struggling with. So I'm giving you some prescriptions here. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. John writes and says, don't love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world, y'all, is passing away, and the lusts that are in it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. He's established. He's rooted there. Now, you could sit there and think, well, you know, I, I just can't imagine anybody being overcome by, you know, the lust for other things or the love of money or the love of the world. And, you know, like they've been a believer for three years now, and that doesn't happen to people who have been believers for three years. So there's a fellow by the name of Demas, and I'll say this quickly. Demas traveled with the Apostle Paul. He was, he was at Paul's right hand and was involved in ministry with Paul. When you're involved with ministry with the Apostle Paul, how many of you know, like, you, you get a front row seat into what God's doing. You're seeing miracles and mayhem at the same time. Conflict and controversy in the midst of kingdom. Demas is that guy. And in the last book, in the last chapter that Paul writes in his entire life, he mentions Demas. And Demas 
It says of him, 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, Demas has forsaken me. Why? Because he has loved the present world. So here's the guy who at some point in his life, he was good soil. He had it going on. He's with Paul, man. He's, you know, he's producing fruit. But somewhere in the process, he became thorny soil. And the love of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things got Demas to the point where he told Paul, not just see you later, but like, I'm forsaking you. Love you, Paul. It's been great, but can't handle it anymore, and so I'm out. No, no, no. Like, you know, I'm forsaking you. He didn't start that way. He ended that way. He wasn't paying attention to his soil. Well, good soil, let's wrap this up. This isn't wayside, uncared for, neglected soil. It's not stony, shallow, lack of depth or root soil. It's not thorny, anxious, wanting to be rich or worldly soil. It's good soil. And this good soil hears the word just like the other three did, but the good soil responds differently. Jesus said that good soil accepts, hears the word, and then accepts it. This is such a beautiful Greek word, accepting it. It means to embrace it, to hug it, to be affectionate toward it, to believe it and receive it and want it. It's a whole different thing than just hearing it. It's a whole different thing than just being happy about it. It is a full-blown embrace of what God has to say to you about your life, about your situation, or about the season that you're in. Good soil. It hears the word and it accepts it. It accepts it whether it likes it or not at the first reading, at, at the first contact with it. it. It embraces it when it challenges them. It embraces it when it cuts them. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of the wicked. Good soil receives the word of God and says, as hard as this might be, as challenging as this might be, I'm trusting you. I might be struggling, I might be challenged by it, I might be heartbroken over it, but I'm not letting go of this word. And I don't care, Satan's not gonna steal it from me. He's not gonna challenge it out of me. He's not gonna deceive me out of this. I am holding on to what you have revealed to me about yourself and about my circumstance. Good soil, that's what good soil does. And then what does good soil do? It bears fruit. It's the only soil that does. The good soil, it bears fruit. It experiences kingdom impact in itself for the person. And again, it flows out to touch other people. Someone who is good soil. This is someone who, who understands the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings, but also embraces the power of his resurrection. Both extremes, I'm in it to win it. Suffering, yes, resurrection, yes. Power, weakness, all of it, trust, good soil. Good soil, that's what I am determined to be in my life, not just about this situation that God brought to my attention, but for the next situation and the next situation and the next season and the rest of my life, my goal is good soil because I realize it's the only soil that produces fruit. Whew. Let me just end you with some promises from Jesus. For time's sake, I combine this. John 15, read all of John 15. But John 15, 4, 5, 8, and 16, listen to the words of Jesus. It's in red. Jesus said, 
abide in me. That means consistent seeking of God. I am abiding in him. I'm abiding in his word. I'm abiding in his presence. I'm abiding in worship. I'm abiding in truth. Abide in me, Jesus said, and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Parenthetically, lives the abundant life. Has experienced kingdom impact and has given kingdom impact to others. For without me, you can do nothing. Do you think Jesus meant that when he said that? Without me, you can do nothing. I think he meant it. I don't think he was lying. We just need to believe it. Without him, we can do nothing. Nothing in the Greek. It means nothing. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. You didn't choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Jesus is about his followers bearing fruit. And he's about his followers bearing fruit that remains. It doesn't wither. It doesn't get scorched. It remains. The way we have fruit that remains is by being good soil. So to hell with bad soil. It's a word in the Bible. (laughs) Thorny soil, wayside soil, stony soil. Uh Uh-uh. That's not God's will for my life in Christ Jesus. He has appointed good soil for me to bear fruit. And he's done the exact same thing for you. So, how about You get dirtier than ever. Turn up your fallow ground. Break it up. Get rid of the trash. Get rid of the thorns and the stones. Get rid of anything that would keep you from being good soil. Do business with God today. Purge it, clean it, break up your fallow ground. Be good soil. So Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we... We do, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We thank you for your word, for your promise, for your instruction. We thank you that your word is living and powerful, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it is able to pierce deeply between joint and marrow and the thoughts and the intents of our heart. It gets down to the heart of the matter. Thank you for the power of your word, Lord. Thank you that you honor your word above your own name. Thank you that Jesus is the word. So much to think about. Lord, we want to be good soul and we want to bear much fruit. And always and at all times, for your honor and glory, move on our hearts by your spirit. And may it be so. Good soil, good fruit, Jesus. Amen, somebody. Amen, amen, and amen.